Hello, and thank you again for joining us today for a discussion with Dr. Bruce Mueller, Doctor of Pharmacy and Professor Emeritus of Clinical Pharmacy at the University of Michigan College of Pharmacy, and Dr. Cynthia Silver, Vice President of Medical Affairs at Outset Medical. We're excited for a dynamic discussion on how the pharmacokinetic influence of kidney replacement therapy, or KRT, can impact patient outcomes in the ICU and review newly published data on antibiotic dosing with the Tableau hemodialysis system. Reminder that you can pop in questions throughout today's webinar, and we'll have a live Q&A at the end. Over to you, Dr. Silva. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited about having Dr. Mueller here today from the University of Michigan, our Professor Emeritus, as you heard. He has published more than 150 peer-reviewed manuscripts just on dosing on KRT and other aspects. And so we're in for a real treat today. I wanted to just take a step back and really explain how we came to today. Um, because I know many of you share that as clinicians, we face several challenges with our critically ill patients who crash into the ICU and require renal replacement therapy and other life-saving techniques. They present with you know, complicated backgrounds such as multi-organ failure, fluid overload, and multiple other comorbidities. And so really we're trying to you know, balance our best judgment to prevent patients from trying to die, which is what they're they're doing the second they they hit our ICU, um, and trying to hit therapeutic targets of renal replacement therapy and the antibiotic uh, medications that we're giving them to treat their underlying problems like sepsis and other infections without causing toxicity um, and leaving the patient worse off than when um, you know, they first, well, not that they first met us, but before they came to the ICU. And so as we navigate this incredibly delicate balance, you come to realize that the pharmacists are really your best ally. Um, how they help us manage dosing, target uh, levels, choose best uh, therapeutic drugs. Um, and what goes into that, I think, is not really well understood by everybody involved. And so Dr. Mueller really is here to today to discuss how we can dose antibiotics against established benchmarks in the critically ill patient requiring kidney replacement therapy, how we can decrease the complexity of what we're doing, and most of all, to get better patient outcomes with our focus on patient safety. So, you know, with that in mind, Dr. Mueller, you know, you're a pharmacist and closely involved in many aspects of kidney replacement therapy. Um, and a lot of people, as I mentioned here, they don't understand how closely a hospital pharmacy department should be involved when KRT is started on the ICU patient. Could you just walk us through some of the most important pharmacy issues from your perspective? I'd be happy to. And thanks for the invitation to talk about this. Because you're right, the, the kidney re replacement therapy that's chosen will affect drug dosing, but it also has a lot of other effects that uh, involve a pharmacy department. So, you know, for example, a continuous therapy usually involves some commercially available dialysate and IV replacement solutions that have some electrolyte profile that's put together to meet the needs of the patient, which of course is changing all the time. You know, at most hospitals, the pharmacy department is the keeper of the CRT dialysates and the IV replacement solutions, and we keep them in stock. And, at, you know, at my hospital, we spend more than a million dollars a year just on these solutions. So that they're really expensive. It's not like you can go grab a bottle of saline or D5W. It's, it's much more complicated than that because we're customizing them and then that makes them have expiration dates and sometimes they have to be refrigerated. So there's actually a lot to it in the pharmacy department just with the solution aspects to it. You now we're compounding frequently uh, at our institution, the most common changes to a standard uh, replacement solution or a dialysate is it, you know, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium and bicarbonate. Those are the four that are gonna be moved the most. And, and we, checked out, we wrote some papers on looking at how often do you have to customize? You know, patients come in with acute kidney injury and they can be 
really hyperkalemic and hyperphosphatemic. Of course, they could be really hypokalemic and hypophosphatemic. They could be everywhere, as you know. But by even the most hyperkalemic patient, for example, by day two or three, I've got to make sure there's some potassium uh, in that solution. And it's changing from what I'm going to use on day one then to what I'm going to use on day four, as an example. And, you know, phosphorus, I think, is another one that's gotten a lot of attention. Uh, there are phosphate-containing dialysates. They're pretty darn expensive. Uh, a lot of hospitals don't have them, so therefore they have to be made by the pharmacy department. Uh, and you can expect by day three to be having to supplement phosphorus in some way. If you put it in a dialysate replacement solution, you're giving oral phosphate, nutrition, whatever. But, you know, we really want to watch phosphate because of, uh, in CRT patients, hypophosphatemic patients require long respiratory support. So there's a lot going on just with the solutions in the pharmacy department. It costs a lot of money. And then, you know, a lot of pharmacy departments will limit how often you can customize. Now, obviously, we always want to do what's best for the patient, but you can't change the order every two hours because we don't make them one liter at a time. You know, we're making them in batches because that's the most efficient way to do it. And if you change the solution, you know, every hour or two, I got to throw away all of what I just made. And, it, and it's really expensive. So, you know, there's that aspect to it. And I, I don't always think that clinicians think about the, the pharmacy aspects to it until there's no bottles on the floor. And then you say, hey, pharmacy, where the heck are those bottles, you know? But, you know, the other thing that you talked about is antibiotic dosing. And it's really an essential part of any pharmacist's job. Wow. So, you know, it sounds like pharmacy is intimately involved when solutions are used in particular. So, you know, what does the literature say about how well clinicians dose antibiotics in ICU patients receiving KRT? Well, and here's a great slide that we have up here. It's a, it's a paper that I think is a, it's an oldie, but a goodie. And, and uh, in 2011, Dr. Seiler published this particular paper and they had 53 CRT patients receiving the most commonly used antibiotics that we still use today, right? meropenem, piptazo, cepapine, septazidine. And they had very specific and I think kind of aggressive um, antibiotic serum concentration targets that they wanted to hit for those patients. And so they measured serum concentrations in these 53 patients. And what they found was something that I think is sad because they dosed pretty aggressively. And you can hit the button here and get pull up what the results were of this particular uh, slide, you know, only four out of five patients getting a pretty aggressive dose of meropenem, a gram every 12 hours, achieved the pharmacodynamic target that they set. Uh, only about two thirds with piptazo at, again, a very aggressive dose, hit the targets. Only half the patients with ceftazidine and nobody getting two grams of cefepine every 12 hours actually hit this aggressive pharmacodynamic target that they chose. Now, that's a pretty aggressive target. And honestly, probably maybe more aggressive than you want to be, but um, in the ICU, where there's you know resistant organisms and all this, you want to be pretty aggressive with your with your antibiotics. And so, you know, to answer your question, we're not very good about it. Now, honestly, if we did this study again today, I bet we get the same results. Yeah. So basically, you know, the the literature doesn't give us good guidance. So, you know, given that antibiotic dosing recommendations have been published for CRT, and you even said those doses were pretty aggressive. Why do you think we're not meeting goals? Well, I think there's a few reasons. One is the resistant organisms generally are in the ICU. So we've got to get higher concentrations a lot of times. But also, you know, from a pharmacokinetic perspective, uh, the patients that we're looking at getting some sort of kidney replacement therapy in the ICU, they've got just sort of the worst pharmacokinetics, you know, possible. You know, fluid overload is a big part, right? So if I give a dose, that, that dose is diluted out because they've got this big volume distribution. So I don't get as high serum concentrations as I would like to have. Uh, often they have reduced serum albumins, they have reduced uh, protein binding of drugs, which you think might be good, but the more drug that's not bound, the more that can be removed by our kidney replacement therapy. And also that contributes to a larger volume distribution again, which is a problem. You know, and then the other part is, um, these patients have a really dynamic liver and kidney function situation. Obviously, we're here talking about kidney function and, or lack thereof, and that's why we're giving a kidney replacement therapy. But we don't even have a way to assess what the livers are doing. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that patients with um, acute kidney injury might still have pretty good functioning livers and are just metabolizing drugs much faster than 
their analogous person with chronic kidney disease would be. So you, you can't see liver function. It's really hard to measure. We think GFR is hard to measure. It's a lot harder to measure what, what the liver is doing to drugs. So, you know, that's a big one. But, you know, if we want to talk about kidneys, um, don't forget there's also a subsection of patients in the ICU who have augmented renal clearance. You know, a superhuman amount of GFR that's clearing drugs really fast. And you can't tell by looking at somebody that that's the case either. And so we're really, we've got it all against us. Pharmacokinetically, it's, it, it's against the patient who's in the ICU that you're going to achieve good goals with your antibiotics. Yeah, wow. I, you know, I guess I, I realize the laundry list. I just choose to ignore, ignore the liver because we're only here to talk about the kidney. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, realistically, this is even more complex than at first glance. Um, you know, and we know CRRT, those patients have high mar uh, mortality, mortality rates. Can you teach us the, you know, delicate balancing act between pharmacokinetic influences and mortality? Sure. And, you know, we, we wrote a paper a few years ago, kind of made a little teeter-totter here about there are some reasons you, why you might want to use higher doses, sort of on the left. But there is reasons you might consider you want to use lower doses. And if you if you look at it, and you know, I'll tell you the end of the story first, the teeter-totter, I think, goes toward using higher doses. And we talked about what some of those reasons are. You know, at the top of the left side there, um, patients may have really good liver function metabolizing their, their antibiotics in acute kidney injury. That's pretty, we know this is true with uh, amapenem. We know it's true with meropenem. We know it's true with vancomycin. Now, vancomycin, we can measure serum concentrations, but we can't with these other drugs. So that's sort of an invisible thing working against us and working against our patient. We want to ensure therapeutic serum concentrations at the target site, which means that's not always in the blood, right? It might be a big hunk of pneumonia and there's bugs inside of it. How do you get the drug to that target? You're going to have to give higher concentrations of drug to try to get drug penetration to wherever that infection is. Meanwhile, we've turned on some sort of uh, kidney replacement therapy that's removing drug. Um, we know, as I said already, there's more um, antibacterial anti resistance going on. And then finally, I already talked about the kinetics, increased volume distribution and, and decreased protein binding, which is making the drug be diluted out. So to me, these are reasons why we use higher doses. And I, I recognize that on the other side of the teeter-totter here is that we are concerned about toxicity. I mean, I was around when imipenem was launched and we you know, we saw seizures when we didn't adjust doses. And I know that the renal clearance is reduced. Uh, and of course I wanna save money, but those aren't good enough reasons to me. There's all these other reasons why we have to be much more aggressive in our dosing. And to rethink about how we approach the septic patient, especially with kidney injury um, in the ICU. Yeah, so I mean, this kind of paints a pretty grim picture for the patient in the ICU. Um, it's a challenging environment for the clinicians to excel at saving lives. However, the point of this webinar, right? All is not lost. And that's why I'm excited about um, your recent paper here um, that you published on Tableau. Can you talk to us a little bit about the findings um, and maybe shed some light on this and give hope for patients in the ICU? Okay. I don't know if you have a slide that's got the research methods, but if, if you don't, we can go from here. But um, uh, anyway, we looked at the Tableau machine settings and what was possible uh, for, for these patients. And, you know, because of the different blood flows that are available, the dialysate flows, the ultrafiltrate uh, flows, there's a lot of different combinations that can be done. And they are similar to a lot of cases a dialysis or a, a continuous kind of therapy or a, you know, something like a sled or a PERT. And I know I'm using all these terms. I'm hoping everybody, you know, on, on this call knows what I'm talking about here, but there's all different kinds of flow systems uh, with different rates. And because the Tableau system can do all these things and give the clinician a lot of flexibility, that's good for the patient from a solute removal perspective and from a fluid removal perspective. But from my perspective, the pharmacist, it's got a big thing to do with um, drugs and how our drugs are removed because they're going to be removed differently with each of the different possibilities. And so we we looked, um, how could we figure out dosing in these patients without having to do clinical trials at each of these settings? And it's impossible to do uh, you know, a clinical trial in all these settings. So what we did instead is we did a 
uh, uh, Monte Carlo analysis. And so what we did is we went and looked at uh, the five most common types of, of renal replacement therapy. And on the slide that you see here, which is from table two, if you look across the top, there's a, a three times a week kind of hemodialysis. There's a daily hemodialysis type. There's a, something called a sequential therapy, which has got sort of a, a, a like a sled, but in between there, turning on um, a little bit of uh, ultrafiltration as it goes, or a standard sort of um, what we'd call a PERT or a, you know a intermittent, it's more like a hemodialysis or a slow dialysis kind of thing that goes for nine hours a day, or even if you ran that all day long. These are all possibilities with the Tableau machine. And we said, well, my goodness, what, what doses of these five most common antibiotics, cefepime, ceftazidime, imipenem, miropenem, and, and piptazo, what would be the right doses? And um, how do you do this without doing a clinical trial? Well, what you do is, what we did was we did something called a Monte Carlo analysis, where we went and looked at, at patients who had acute kidney injury and needed renal replacement therapy and found out what the pharmacokinetics for each of these drugs was in those patients themselves. And looking at what the averages are and what the variability is around this, we could then take using a Monte Carlo analysis, aspects of published pharmacokinetics in this patient population to see how they might express how they handle each of these five antibiotics. And then through some modeling that we've done, able to turn on dialysis or a continuous therapy on and off, uh, we can actually see how each of these 5,000 patients does with a given dose of any of these antibiotics. And so this is how we put it together. We've done this with some other uh, kinds of renal replacement therapies and, and some other drugs, some investigational drugs to try to get an idea, what kind of doses should we use in a patient before even a drug might even come to market. And so here, these drugs have been on the market for a long time. And now what's new is the different ways that we can use the renal replacement therapy. And so using these Monte Carlo techniques, this is how we came up with dosing for these five most common drugs. And so um, I don't know what your next slide looks like, Dr. Silva. Yeah. Uh, it, it's uh -huh. looking at the different um, settings that you're right. so, about. So here they are, right? So we have, again, this sort of a, a three times a week kind of dialysis, sort of a Monday, Wednesday, Friday dialysis that we think about almost in the outpatient setting, but there are plenty of hospitals doing this. And if a patient is not massively fluid overloaded, you can get away with it, right? Or a daily dialysis, which given the metabolic needs of our patients, often it's in the ICU we need to do. But then these other ones, doing that daily dialysis and adding a little ultrafiltration in between um, down to setting four, and I have it as 4A and 4B because it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, what the question I ask the pharmacist is, what's the right dose to, to use in something like SLED or this PIKRT kind of thing? And, and, and what the dose is, and as important as when's the dose? Am I giving the dose and then all of a sudden turning on nine hours of dialysis? Or am I doing nine hours of dialysis and then giving the dose? And the pharmacist has got to come up with the right dose in both of those situations. Uh, because generally we time our antibiotics to be given when dialysis ends. And then finally, if you ran something more uh, continuously, you ran sort of a 50 milliliter a minute all day long, which is like three liters of, of dialysate flow or ultrafiltrate production, whatever it's going to be, and you run that nonstop, what would the doses be? And so these were the five settings that we used this Monte Carnival analysis against for each of the five drugs. And our goal was for that we come up with a dose and it's the lowest dose possible that 90% of the patients are gonna be therapeutic all through the week. Uh, and that's the important thing. You think you could get to 100%, I guess I could get to 100%, I could give just massive, massive doses, but then I'm gonna have a lot of toxicity. So these are the right. lowest possible doses that hits 90% of the patients. And if you get there, you're in really good shape. And that would certainly be a lot better than what that previous study just showed you where we weren't getting therapeutic in a lot of, with a lot of these drugs. Right. And and that's your balancing act that, that you were alluding to when you're talking Absolutely. about 90%. Absolutely. Exactly. So this um, is what we modeled right here. Um, yeah. And, and so uh, maybe go up to the previous slide here and um, we can look at the results. So here you go. So you can see that the, what we have uh, in this table is comes from the paper or what were the doses that that met the criteria of the lowest possible dose that 50 percent of patients i'm sorry 90 percent of patients were i'll say therapeutic or hitting the goals 
And for columns one, two, and three, so the thrice weekly dialysis, the daily dialysis, the sequential therapy, amazingly, uh, and this is not something I anticipated, to be honest, these doses that we have listed cover all three. And you can look at those doses compared to what you use in your own institution and see that they're, they're pretty aggressive doses. I think it's important to you know note that these doses generally, when possible, are giving after dialysis, whenever you can do that. Um, and we'll talk about maybe that's not always possible, but, but here's the doses. I mean, these are pretty aggressive doses. I think the other thing to point out when you look at these doses are a lot of times we're recommending a loading dose. Why are we recommending a loading dose? Because generally speaking, we don't use loading doses for our patients. You know, We just give some dose and we say this much Q8 or whatever. But because these patients are fluid overloaded, they've got a bigger volume. So you want to load them up because uh, they have a bigger volume than normal. And we know that time to therapeutic concentration is so important. And so loading them as fast as you can is the way to go. And so in these patients, I'm, I'm a firm believer of loading doses. And I can tell you when we modeled this out, loading doses made a big difference. You know, if you go to the fourth column, you see what would you do in a, in a, um, a sort of a sled type setting uh, with this nine hour sort of PERT kind of thing. And you can see again, the doses are, Notice that it doesn't say before or after dialysis here. You just give it and give and give and give. And you just give the doses. And I don't care if you're four hours into the dialysis setting, they need antibiotic, you give it to them. And when we modeled that out, we could still be therapeutic in 90% of patients using this kind of uh, a model here. So that's what we did. And then finally, uh, column five is what do you do if you're running this extended 50 milliliters a minute? Uh, and there you go. There is, those are the doses that we came up with that hit 90% of patients. Yeah. For our PERT patients to your right. point. Right. Yep. So there, so that's, that's kind of what we came up with and, um, and, it, and it worked really well. Yeah, this is great. You know, this is valuable data because it really defines the benchmarks and that's really rare to have with these long dialysis treatments. So this is fantastic. You know, Obviously, we couldn't cover every drug. I mean, I could hold you here for forever um, and go over every single drug for KRT. Um, and, you know, I see the questions coming in. There's a lot of energy. Where can our audience get um, more information on this topic? Right. So what's going to, you, you can't look at them all, right? And so how can I solve this? I have done, as I said before, sort of Monte Carlo simulations where there isn't existing information. I've tried to publish that in those 150 something papers that you've been talking about. But the project I've been working on in the last few years that I think your audience here will have access to is that we've been working on um, with, a, with a company called Up to Date or Lexicomp or Lexa Drugs. This is something that's a computer system that's attached to most patients, I'm sorry, most institutions, electronic medical records. And we've been rewriting all the renal dosing uh, for that for the last like four years or so. And so I expect that most of the people on this call have access to up to date or Lexicomp or whatever it is in there and yeah, they can exactly. look it up directly. And so when we wrote these, we wanted to make sure we had all new kinds of kidney replacement therapies taken care of. So the sleds and the, the CRT types and different rates. And so we've kind of put those in there. And so this is a project that, uh, like I said, for four years, uh, Jason Roberts in Australia, Mike Hong at University of Michigan, along with me, have been working on, and we have read every single paper that has to do with dosing. I don't care if it's from the 50s, 60s, we've read them to come up with um, new dosing recommendations that even differ, you know, from some of the published recommendations that you'll see, even, even ones I wrote, maybe I wrote something 20 years ago. And, but we have a new understanding about pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, with certainly dialysis has changed, right? And so because we, these things have changed, organisms have changed and have gotten more resistant, the old recommendations don't really work anymore. So for, the, for this audience, uh, I want you to know that we have done over 400 drugs now, including any of the ones you're using in the ICU right now. Uh, and the, it's really interesting. I asked the people at UpToDate to, to give me some stats. And what's fascinating is that the renal section of the UpToDate area where you would look this up uh, between August of 22 and August of 23, was accessed 17 million times. Wow, that's Which crazy. is amazing. So, you know, people are using it. I think most people here maybe okay. know that that exists, but it, but it exists. And to me, it's the most comprehensive place for you to start your search. I know that the recommendations sometimes are different than what's published. It's because they're the newest. 
and they reflect, I think, our new understanding of how drugs work and how dialysis works. And so, you know, for me, I have the highest degree of confidence that this is where you're going to get the best recommendations for whatever drug you're interested in. I still got three more drugs on my to-do list this month that I got to get done. <laughs> so we're, we continue to add as new drugs get put in uh, or clinicians ask questions, we kind of look at them again. So to me, that's where they should really look. My to-do list looks a little different, but um, I won't I won't bore the, the viewers with that. So, um, you know, you guys can scan the QR code for this paper that Dr. Mueller was talking about. I think I would um, really like to transition into the question and answer portion, um, because I think what we've gone over here is that with Tableau, you can be confident that you're keeping patients safe on their um, dialysis treatment while hitting drug targets. Um, so I will start, Dr. Mueller, we received a bunch before the webinar. We'll incorporate okay. them all in. So the first one that I have is, do we arrange antibiotic schedule around KRT times or no change is needed? Sure. So the continuous therapies, uh, so the, the CRT type therapies, obviously you're just going to give it when you give it, right? That's just like somebody has their own kidneys. But in a case we're using an, an intermittent dialysis thing, whether that's hemodialysis or a sled or, you know, PERG or however, whatever you call it in your institution, you know, generally I want to give the dose after dialysis. So that's in general. And if you think back to that table that I showed you earlier, I think it was our old slide talked about our recommendations. And for the most part, I was saying, give the doses after dialysis because, you know, you don't want to just give the antibiotic and it gets sucked away immediately by dialysis. So you, you'd like to give the doses at the end of dialysis. However, I'm going to say this one more time. Yeah, don't hold a dose. You know, someone's getting perk for, for eight or nine hours. You're not going to hold the dose until that's over. You're not going to wait, you know, three or four hours to give a first dose of an antibiotic to a septic patient. Give them the dose. Give them the loading dose. And when dialysis ends, give them the second dose. Get antibiotics into these patients as you can because there is an association between delay of antibiotic dose and patient outcome. So we, I'm on the aggressive side. I mean, I, I know you can see adverse effects from antibiotics, certainly. And, you know, even though the drug study here, cefepime, imipenem, uh, especially, I mean, there are some CNS effects. I, I, I know it. But um, the majority of patients on continuous renal replacement therapy, their mortality is high, and the number one cause of death is infection. Let's give antibiotics. We have drugs that treat infection. Yeah, that's that's great advice, really. Um, second question we received, can you provide any information on antibiotic dosing for sled performed on the Tableau machine? Yeah. So what we've calculated there, and I think it was the fourth column said P-I-K-R-T. I use that because people don't like sled. Sled means, you know, Do you want me to go dosage. back? Do you want sure, me to you go can back show that slide if you like, uh, which, which have the, the answers. Uh, I use the actual parameters of that Tableau can do. So I can tell you that's really based on Tableau stuff. I don't know if you can get your slides up again, but if you can, uh, otherwise they can use the QR code. But um, the bottom line is those were using parameters uh, associated with that. But, uh, you know, slide is slow, low efficiency dialysis. Well, I don't think the membranes being used by Tableau are low efficiency. Uh, anymore, right? So they're they're you know they're nice big porous membranes, and so we modeled it as if that was the case. So uh, when you see recommendations in this paper, or even the ones I talked about up to date, uh, that will work for the flow rates that are seen with the Tableau machine. So whether you get the slides up or not, don't worry. Yeah, about I got it. it. Again, you have a you have a nephrologist trying to do. Um... Oh, that's it. This is it. You need that's. Oh, look yeah. at that. Let's let's roll let's roll down to the results. Shouldn't have uh, left me in charge. There of that. you go. I know you should shouldn't let you drive. So column four yeah. here would be these the sled type uh, situation, and so those are the doses that I would be starting with for these drugs, and then for drugs other other than these, I would go toward that uh, those published recommendations and the and the up to date that are associated with the electronic medical record of, uh, of your institution. That's great. Um, okay, another question for you. So do you have dosing for the entire range of Tableau's dialysis rates? Right. So I like this table up here because- uh, <laughs> Go was, back. 
Now you can't blame it on right? me. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You know, the Tableau machine could do so many things, right? Uh, if you are running the Tableau with really typical flow rates like you would do in like the, any of these that we, we modeled here, right? Um, even, you know, column five was running an ultra filtration or dialysis flow rate, I forget which, but at three liters an hour, 50 milliliters right. a minute, okay, there's your doses. Now, if you do things that are like pretty wild, like you ran dialysis flow rates for 24 hours, okay, then that's not gonna, that's not gonna work, right? That's, these dosing recommendations aren't for that. But if you're using anywhere near conventional kinds, kinds of, of flow rates, uh, you're gonna be fine with these recommendations. Another question for you. They're like pouring in. How does okay. this study account for the individual individual variability we see for drugs like piperacillin in the ICU? Right. And, and to me, this is uh, an important question because there is so much variability. The, you know, you've got the patient, you've got, I mean, I have patients that were 30 liters fluid overloaded and somebody else who wasn't fluid overloaded at all, as an example, right? And you know, some patients are big bags of water and some are not in each and some outweigh 200 kilograms and some weigh 45, right? They're all different. Uh, and each of those presents a different challenge to us. So there's a lot of variability. Um, the nice thing about using the Monte Carlo uh, approach that we did is it actually chose um, pharmacokinetic data from critically ill patients. So that, and it's almost like, you know, what's the average clearance? You know, what's the average volume distribution? average volume distribution, but also what's the variability around that. So the patients that we make through Monte Carlo are based on actual sick patients with all that variability. And then the patients themselves and their demographics and weights came from uh, Sean Bagshaw's paper, I think it was in 2020 in the New England Journal of Medicine, this big uh, multinational uh, CRT group. And I think the average, I know it's in the paper, but the average weight was something like 85 kilos, but plus or minus a lot. And this was Europe, this was the United States, it was all over Australia. And so I think we've got all their variability baked into this. And, um, you know, a smaller patient, you might say, gosh, that's a big dose for such a small patient. It's true, it is. But also those patients are getting cleared faster as well. That volume distribution gets cleared faster. And so the doses provided here on this table that's in this slide cover the kinds of patients you're going to see who are adults, say, over, well, I'm going to say like, 45 kilograms and larger, these doses will cover it. Now, maybe not the 400 yeah. kilogram patient. Okay, I, I grant you that that one didn't fit into the model, but right. like, we were modeling patients, you know, even into the 160 kilogram size. Yeah, and I think that end of the spectrum of, you know, quite morbidly obese, we we don't have benchmarks for yet all around. So, uh, you know, th and that- so, you sense. know, that brings me to, I think, which I, I see is the next question here. And that is, okay, what role does serum concentration monitoring have? And I think it does have a place if you have the laboratory that can do it. So, uh, you know, sometimes if you're sending it out, you're not gonna get the result back for three, four days, it doesn't do you much good. But if you do have the ability to get serum concentrations, then it's great. And then I'd say to you how to get those, those serum concentrations are, I mean, the best way is to draw the blood, not from the circuit, because the circuit is a dual lumen venous catheter. And, you know, are you getting pure water? Is there a little bit of recirculation? Even not a lot, but some. And then where do you draw it in the circuit? You certainly want to draw it as close to the patient as possible before any uh, IV replacement solutions go in, for example, because you really want to see what does this look like in the blood. So that's where you would draw the blood and actually preferably not in the circuit at all. And then based on that, that is when, you know, you're going to make whatever your pharmacist should be doing these calculations for you in terms of, um, you know, what, what the dose ought to be. And so, you know, if you get a patient on the extremes, like we were talking about the morbidly obese patient as a good example, or somebody who's just not recovering, or you're doing a kind of an atypical renal replacement therapy and you're not sure about it, then I think serum concentration monitoring is really important. And I think frequently that we aren't, you know, we don't know. We're, we're taking estimated good clinical uh guesses, but that's judge, you know, that's judgment based on experience. So to your point, um, that's, that's the place we find ourselves. So I got a great question here from Dustin. Hi, Dustin. Thanks for the, thanks for the question is, uh, what do you do with your patients who are unstable? Uh, sometimes you can't get eight hours or nine hours or you, or you, sometimes you can get 12, but, 
or you can only get six, but <clears throat> you want to run something longer because you got to remove fluid. Um, I mean, I think I got this nine hour because I had to choose a number <laughs> and I didn't think six was really pert. And I didn't, you know, I thought 12 was the longest and maybe eight. So I, I chose nine hours when we did the model. I think you're going to be pretty darn close if you're using the flow rates we used and you got six to 12 hours. I think I can live with what you got. Um, you you said you were using cefepime, for example, two grams Q12 to one grams Q6. Yeah, I like that. Um, uh, I, I think that's a reasonable dose to be doing in your patients. Uh, the one gram Q6 is important, I think, because, you know, these, the, the antibiotics we chose here, they all work as long as you're at a serum concentration. They don't work twice as good if you're at double the serum concentration. So more smaller doses more frequently generally are better for these beta-lactam sort of uh, antibiotics. And so if you're using that dose, I think you're going to be covered what you do at your institution. Uh, another question I see here on, I'm, should I keep going? Dr. Silva, I'm just talking. Yeah, away. take it away. Hey, okay, I'm going. you, you right, drive so. better than me. So all I'll right. Dr. Lincoln, uh, when we dose patients in column one, which is a thrice weekly hemodialysis, what do we do on non-dialysis days? Um, we, uh, every one of those says just give something post dialysis and then you do nothing on the other day. You're covered. Uh, I assume the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, when I did the, when I did this, okay, or in every other day kind of a thing. So the answer to your question is you don't do anything. You got enough to, you know, one of the advantages of renal failure is that they don't get rid of these antibiotics very quickly. And so you actually maintain a, a therapeutic serum concentration in these patients for a long time. And so it's kind of weird to call it an advantage, but in fact, you do keep them bathed in beta-lactam antibiotic and that's why that could uh, the next question here is, let's see, does column one represent dosing on dialysis days? Okay, I just answered that one. So yeah, so what you see is what you do and you don't do anything on the non-dialysis day. So if you're going every other day, for example, you're covered for the next, well, well let's, let's, let's look at the top here, cefepime, right? So cefepime at the top, column one, all right, says two gram loading dose, then one gram every 24 hours post-dialysis. So what does that say to you? It says after dialysis, give a dose. The next day, 24 hours later, you give another dose. So that's a non-dialysis day, but you're good for 24 hours. And that's what you're going to do. So uh, let's go down to, let's see, what's the next drug? Cetazim, same thing. They do a gram every 24 hours post-dialysis. So if that's on Monday, Tuesday, 24 hours later, you're going to give your dose. Okay, and so that's what you're going to follow. So this covers, this kind of tells you what you do all the days. Right. Give your dose post-dialysis, looking at, let's see, imipenem, the most aggressive one there, if you're really, really being aggressive, 750 milligrams every eight hours post-hemodialysis. That's what it is, every eight hours post-hemodialysis. So do whatever it says, that's all the days. Okay, That's all the days. That's Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. It's telling you what to do. Time it for after dialysis. All right. So I think... Um... I think that's been great. Um, I think if we have no more questions, you know, your guidance um, from the paper, as well as up to date and other resources, I think is going to help clarify. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today, um, imparting your knowledge. Uh, I could also hand out your personal contact and we can just always call you when we're at the bedside, but that's not going to work for us. So we really appreciate you today, Dr. Mueller. Thank you. Start with your pharmacist. They should be able to help and they know how to get a hold of me. I'm, I'm findable uh, if they've got questions. And I will embarrass you. Happy 21st birthday. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this on is how I celebrate birthday. my birthday. Yes. All right, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Mueller and Dr. Silva, for a wonderful discussion and for you all for taking the time to join us today. We'll be following up with a recording. Keep an eye out and have a great rest of your day.